December 22nd, 2013. This is Edible Acres. It's the second video I did for today, and uh, it's the first time I'm filming inside. And I'm going to talk about creating biochar or charcoal in a wood stove as part of uh, heating the home, kind of capturing all the pyrolysized gases and recombusting them in the stove box, and trying to stack function by having the heat that's generated from the pyrolysis of the wood that's in here, and I'll talk about that in a second, have that heat captured and reflected uh, in the stove box and used to do some cooking. I've got water that I'm going to fill up here and crush some hickory nuts and make hickory nut tea, and I've got a miso shiitake soup from stuff from the farm here that I'm cooking in the other one, so um, it would be helpful to have the fire hotter for a little while in order to cook that stuff and at the same time I might be able to generate some charcoal. And you can see I've let the stove die down quite a bit, it's just an ember base so that I can fit this container in and so far it seems really promising that it's going to work. This is the first batch I made from basically this container filled exactly like this. This is all locust bark and chips from when I used a hatchet to sharpen I don't know, a few hundred locust stakes that I use to mark my trees. And so I swept all that stuff up, put it in boxes, and now I'm just dipping into it and trying to generate charcoal from it. And I figure locusts being really good hardwood would make really excellent charcoal. So that'll go in here, which is a nice metal container that will fit in the wood stove, just barely, and allow gases to escape. And I'll film what that looks like allow gases to escape without free flow of oxygen back into the container in order to finish combustion. And so what that is is basically high heat pyrolysis where the volatile oils and compounds in the wood are driven off by the heat that radiates into it from the stove. And those gases, rather than being released into the environment during normal charcoal production, are used to fuel the fire, which increases the heat, which increases the state of pyrolysis, which fuels the fire. So it's like a feedback loop. And it should finish this off very quickly. I'm going to make a note of when I start it and how long it takes to get to a completed state. And as far as I understand, this is basically as good a charcoal as I could want. Um, it's pure black all the way through. There's not a single piece that has any brown within it. It's all crystalline sounding. There's not a fleck of ash. And there's like a blue-black, almost purple tone to it, which from all the research I've done tells me I got really well done high heat pyrolysis on very dense hardwood. That's what it should sound like, little crystals. I'm just crushing to nothing. The only ash that was in here when I took it out was a little bit of ash from a piece of wood that had fallen in, so it should be basically pure charcoal. And if I can render a few batches per day, or just one, you know, each night when I put in the last log, put the container in, put a log on top, let it cook down, and in the morning take it out when I go to clean out the ashes. So I'm going to pause for a second and get ready to load this thing in and film that part. Okay, so I've got this container. Uh, I showed you before how it's got all the locusts in there filled up to the halfway mark. I'd love to fill it all the way up, but I don't know how to do that yet. Um, and then I just made sure the lid sat well on the seam so there's not room for air to come in, and then tied a piece of jute yarn so that I can load it in. I found I had to put it in at an angle, and this way the lid won't fall off while I'm doing this one-handed. So I'm going to go in through the side door. Actually, last time I did it, there was a bunch of firewood in there, so it was difficult to load it through the front. Ooh, that's hot. And with just a coal bed, I should be able to put that in. Almost like I'm making a roast. We'll see how this works. The box is probably a little bit cooler than the last time I did it, but I suspect there's enough heat in there to start driving off some gases and then have those combust. And I expect, yeah, see the jute yarn's burning off right away. Um, right now, the top of the stove is at the 300 Fahrenheit mark and pipes below 200, but it's triple wall insulated. And so I'm going to pause here. It's now 5:40 p.m. I'm going to pause here and pick up the video again when this starts actively driving off gases and combusting. It's kind of beautiful 
Um, I want people to see that. Again, if you're going to try this, from what I understand of it, what is mission critical, absolutely critical, is what you do not do is put a metal container in your stove that is absolutely airtight, filled with wood or other combustibles. You could have an explosion because the gases need somewhere to go. This is a casserole. I don't know if it's the best thing to use or a roasting pan. It's what I had. I got it at a uh, Finger Lakes reuse. Um, for a dollar or something like that and it really allows the gases out and it's um, but it sits down so it doesn't allow oxygen in so it has to allow some vapors to leave otherwise you could have a really dangerous thing I don't want anybody trying this with you know a paint can that's hammered shut and have it explode in their wood box so I'm gonna pause for now and then start again when the flames are licking it's an interesting it's actually one minute later and I'm already seeing, maybe it's coming on the video camera, there's vapors that are already starting to get forced out of this. I think all it's going to take is one of those vapors getting snagged by enough heat to start catching on fire. Um, and it should be having a really solid afterburn. So I'm going to pick up with that as soon as it happens. I would suspect if I put, actually, if I open this bottom, and just let it charge just to get a little more heat in there. Let's see if that doesn't pick it up. All right, see, so that like activates the coals. I'll start it again when the flames are licking in a real serious way. But this is only a minute in and it's already looking like it's just about ready to uh, do a secondary combustion. So at 6 p.m., we're looking at a little less than 20 minutes from when uh, it started or when I first put this thing in. This is a very clear example of um, pyrolysis gases, at least from what I understand from my readings and stuff. In other words, volatile gases and organic compounds being driven off from the wood that's inside the container, hitting an environment where that's hot enough for them to combust and fully combusting. So the charring process is being fueled by the gases coming off of this. You can see there's no additional firewood in there. There's just the coal base that got it started. So uh, it should be able to bring itself to completion from its own fuel reflection of heat. We'll see how that goes. And then once I take it out, I'll just add some firewood back in and get things going normal way for the evening. Um, so it's doing nicely, I think. And again, we're holding on the wood stove pretty much the same temperature as before, 300. A little cool, but not bad. Um, enough to be bringing the water up, you know, aiming it up towards the simmer and keeping the soup going a little bit. Could be warmer, so maybe I'll add a little firewood in behind it, but kind of neat looking. Okay, so we're about 35 minutes in at this point, and you can see it's really ripping. The last bit of video I was suspecting, oh, maybe I can get away with it, just not... Uh, no other fuel that it'll feed itself. It definitely petered out. I think the coal bed was a little weak. Um, 15, 20 minutes or so into it, it there was no longer uh, gases shooting out with flame on them. It was just kind of like dying down. So I added one little log and a little piece in the front, and it's really picking up. Um, and it's nice. I'm seeing in the stove. It's got good reburn happening up top. So it's a good clean combustion. The damper's all the way open. And it's definitely starting to increase in heat, um, getting up to around 350, which is getting more close to a cooking temperature. A little bonus side note here, this is that hickory nut tea I was talking about. My friend Akiva turned me on to this. He's an awesome nurseryman down in um, Spencer area of New York. If you're ever interested in knowing a guy that's just so into trees, uh, contact Akiva Silver. He's, I think it's twisted twistedtree.net or twisted-tree.net. Anyway, he taught me this trick, and we did a, a little business based around this actually, where we took hickory nuts and, or he crushed them all, and then we boiled them, made this beautiful tea. Um, pretty easy to collect them. You can collect like wheelbarrow fulls in the fall. And then I just find a nice heavy pair of pliers across the, the middle of them. Let's you crush them. Oh, this one's a little too big. I need two hands. But anyway, crushed a bunch in a bag, put them in here. You let it boil for a few hours, add some maple syrup, and you got this like espresso black tea with chunks of nut meat because the meat is oily and oil rises. 
little side note. So I'm having a potluck tonight and folks will be enjoying some hickory nut tea and this soup that's being cooked with the heat needed to generate a nice pile of charcoal. So that should render out that much charcoal, make the house warm for the evening and give us two gallons of hickory nut tea and soup. So stack functions. Anyway, I'll check in again in a little bit. I, next time I'll check in, it'll be when it seems like it's done, so we can move on to the next thing. And that's what it looks like right now as it cooks along. You see those gases shooting out from the edge of the rim there. The heat source of the log is really actively doing this side, so hopefully it's not something where the charcoal is more done over here than over there, but we'll see. So uh, this is the final product. It took one hour, more or less. Probably would have actually gone really fast if I had um, banked up a bunch of wood around it right away. I thought I'd get slick and try to use the pyrolysis gases to do the, the biochar creation, but it really did need a bit of additional fuel to get there. But this is a, I don't know, in my mind, a substantial yield for one hour in the wood stove with all of the off gases being combusted, being used to heat the house, being used to boil two gallons of water to make hickory nut tea, being used to boil a gallon of water to make a big soup um, for folks to enjoy and to end up with this charcoal. Uh, on warm-ish days when I don't need the stove cranking, cranking, um, I don't see why I couldn't do four or five or even six batches of this in a given day. And you can hear the sound quality. It's like super crystally, crunchy. I am hard pressed. I don't think even the thickest pieces here have even the slightest hint. The lighting's not great in here, but there is no part of any of this stuff that didn't get charred perfectly. So I've got pure, pure carbon to. Uh, uh, my thought from here is to bring all this stuff into the garage, put it in metal containers, pulverize it to a, a crumbly, dusty bit with a wooden uh, dowel, and then cover it with urine for a few days in order to activate it with organic matter. Because if I directly added this to the soil, it would rob nutrients for a while, while it got charged, and then it would release it. So I figure uh, urine is loaded with readily available organic compounds, so charge it with that put it into the compost so it can suck up even more stuff and then use that in my potting mix and in the garden. And there you go, food for thought. If you can get a jinky little roasting pan for a buck or a couple bucks at a yard sale that does not seal fully, but seals somewhat well, you can make that much charcoal in an hour in your wood stove and have it put off no gases into the atmosphere. That's some carbon negative stuff right there. That's what I'm talking about. Thanks for watching.